We're going to look at dinosaurs for what they really are, and that is fantastic evidence for creation and not for evolution, a tremendous confirmation of the literal historical accuracy of the Genesis account of history. Now, dinosaurs, unfortunately, have been a big question mark to many evangelical Christians. Many Christian parents have kind of scratched their head and said, well, I don't know what to tell my children when they come home from school and ask the dreaded D question, you know, what about the dinosaurs? So they figure, well, just pat them on the head and tell them to run along and have faith and don't pester us with questions about dinosaurs. That, of course, is not a very good strategy because it makes both our children and the world in general feel that us arrogant Christians don't accept what the evolutionists say, but we don't have anything better to put in its place. Actually, we do. The revelation of the supreme scientist, the supreme historian and eyewitness who was actually there at the beginning, and they weren't. And so his revelation is the best eyewitness scientific account, and it does fit the real facts of science. Now, when Christians have been wondering what to do with dinosaurs, the evolutionists, unfortunately, have been wise as serpents, but not as harmless as doves. They have realized that dinosaurs, it went a little bit too far there, let's see, anyway, I guess this isn't going to go in reverse. Oh, it is going to go in reverse. Wow. You guys are praying out there. Okay. All right. They realize that dinosaurs fascinate children, and they have worked hard to make dinosaurs the icon or the trademark of the so-called fact of evolution. So we have to realize that Christians are not the only fishers of men. We can turn the tables, though, by using dinosaurs for what they ought to be, and that is evidence for creation and not evolution. They point us to the greatest book of science and history that's ever been written, and that, of course, is the Bible, which I don't seem to be getting the effect on this anymore. There we go. By golly. Better late than ever. Okay. The Bible, of course, is not a textbook of science, but considering the author, it ought to at least be accurate when it touches on matters of science and history. And as we shall see, indeed it is. Now, dinosaurs have been found on every continent of this planet, even Antarctica. And that bothers some people. They figure we've got to give some kind of answer because they're everywhere, they're everywhere. What are we going to do? And unfortunately, many Christians have kind of pooled their ignorance on the subject and come up with a lot of ignorant speculations about the dinosaurs, which is unfortunate. We should go to the Word of God and to the creation science that we have today and find there are very good answers. But some honest, well-meaning Christians have actually said, well, uh, you know, the evolutionists use dinosaurs, don't they, to deny the Bible and promote evolution? So it must be they never existed. So when you take your children to the American Museum of Natural History, you have to go, don't look, it's not real. <laughs> well, <laughs> that's not very good. We don't have to deny the evidence. The evidence is real. Our response should be that we have a better explanation. Others have said, you know, the devil put those bones in the ground just to throw us astray. <laughs> well, you've got to give the devil his due, but the Bible doesn't say the devil did that one. Now, others have gone so far as to say God himself put those bones in the ground just to test our faith and see if we would believe his word even though the evidence contradicts it. Now, what kind of God would do that to us? We have enough tests of our faith without God doing that to us. So, I don't think that's quite the case. Oh, very good. We're getting close. Keep on praying. <laughs> okay. Uh, what our answer should be is that those bones are in the ground not to test our faith, but rather to support our faith. If biblical history is true, creation took place. What would we predict about the fossil record? The fossil record would show no transitional fossils. And indeed, there should be many millions, but there's only a handful that they're even worthy, uh, willing to argue about today. And they're so questionable, so equivocal, that many evolutionist experts don't even accept them. Well, that's what creation predicts. Secondly, if there was a great global flood, these fossils would be buried in sedimentary rocks, which is exactly what they are. Creation and the flood at face value, prima facie evidence, is right there, right in the rocks, crying out the biblical truth. Now, unfortunately, many Christians have been intimidated on this subject by the so-called fact of earth history and science called the evolutionary geological column. It is prominently displayed in our textbooks, in our museums, in our national parks. It looks scientific. It even sounds scientific because they use Greek names like Paleozoic, which means ancient life, Mesozoic, which means intermediate life, Cenozoic, which means recent life. But there are a lot of good, solid, scientific, and logical reasons not to believe this. The first and most important one is it denies the testimony of the one eyewitness who was really there to tell us about history. It denies the words of our Creator, Jesus Christ. Jesus said in Mark chapter 10, verse 6, that, but from the beginning of the creation, God made them male and female. Therefore, a man shall leave his father and mother and cleave to his wife, and the two shall become one flesh. Well, this says if Adam and Eve came at all, they came at the end of time, billions of years removed from the beginning of the creation. Again, in Luke 11, 50 and 51, Jesus said, But the blood of all the prophets, which was shed from the foundation of the world, 
shall come upon this generation, from the blood of Abel to the blood of Zechariah. It's like from A to Z, from the first prophet in world history to the last prophet of the Old Testament. According to Jesus, Genesis is real history. He ought to know he was there. And he said his first prophet, Abel's blood, was shed not billions of years after the foundation of the world, which is what this teaches, but at the foundation of the world, at the beginning of time, just like Genesis says. Now Jesus, as C.S. Lewis said, is either a liar, a lunatic, or he's Lord and God. If you're going to call him Lord and God, you better believe what his word says. He said to Nicodemus, I have told you earthly things and you do not believe. How then can you believe if I tell you heavenly things? If God can't get the plain mundane facts of history of how and when things took place straight, he has no authority to tell us anything else. His authority has already been uh, disparaged by the fact that he can't even get history straight. Well, that's not the problem. The problem is that this masquerades as a scientific fact and truth, when indeed it doesn't really exist as depicted in the textbooks anywhere in the world. If it did, this thing would be nearly 100 miles deep. The average fossil bearing rock strata around the Earth is between one to one and a half miles deep, not nearly 100. They take the thickest exposures of certain rock strata that has certain extinct fossils, like trilobites or whatever, and the thickest layers they find, they assume were at least that thick in the past. But it got eroded here and there over millions of years, and here and there it escaped erosion. So the thickest ones are how old it really was, how thick it was. Assuming all that, that assumes old age of the Earth, that assumes evolution, assumes all the things you're supposed to be proving, they then put these things hypothetically <coughs> excuse me, on paper, and by the time the thing is done, it's nearly 100 miles deep. Not only that, where we do find it, such as at the Grand Canyon, the whole top of the chart is missing, we have the fossils in the wrong sequence, and even in reverse order of how they're supposed to be evolved. That's true hundreds of times around the world. They claim overthrust put them in the wrong order. Well, how do you know what order is the correct order? The order that agrees with their preconceived idea of evolution, stage of evolution, symbol to complex over time. It is very mixed up and very contradictory. It only looks perfect on paper because they force the evidence to bow before their preconceived ideas, their preferred prejudice theory. They don't let the evidence sit in judgment on their theory. Now, basically, we can ask this question, since they're using evolution to put the fossil record in this artificial order and to ignore the many contradictions to it, we can ask this question, how do you know that theory is really trustworthy in the first place? Their amazing answer is, well, evolution is not a theory. It's not a hypothesis. It is a fact. And you know how we know it's a fact? Why, because we have this beautiful column here that proves it's a fact. Ah, and how did they get that column? By assuming evolution without proof and using that to put the puzzle together, ignoring all the contradictory evidence. So the main proof for evolution is the assumption that it took place, because they must assume it in order to put the column in the order they want, then they use the order of the column to prove the very theory they started with, arguing in a circle, begging the question, logical fallacy, circular reasoning. Now I find when most people assume what they assume, they usually assume more than they ought to assume every time they assume what they assume, at least I assume so. So we don't have to be afraid of people using assumptions and circular reasoning. Now, to show that I'm not just pulling your leg, we'll quote some evolutionist authorities in this regard, admitting that this really is a problem. Carl Dunbar, author of the Historical Geology textbook, second edition, he says here that no single area contains a record of all geological time. We need only discover and correlate enough of the what? The scattered fragments. Ah, that's what it really looks more like, not this beautiful column all over the place, to build up a composite record of all geologic time. He continues, for more than a hundred years, the geologists of all countries have been cooperating in this endeavor, and the total thickness of the stratified rocks now recognized would exceed 500,000 feet, or some 95 miles, if all the beds were directly superposed. But just how bad is it worldwide? The creationist geologist John Whitmrappy did exhaustive research actually documenting the written admissions of geologists worldwide as to just how out of order the fossil record really is. From their own published admissions, he gleaned this synopsis. Two-thirds of Earth's land surface has only five or fewer of the ten major geologic periods in place. Eighty to eighty-five percent of Earth's land surface does not even have three geologic periods appearing in correct, and that means evolutionary consecutive order. A significant percentage of every geologic period's rocks does not overlie rocks of the next geologic period. Some percentage of every geologic period rests directly upon Precambrian basement, the supposed oldest basement rocks of life. 